Hello and welcome to today's Fat Tail Daily video. Uh, it's been a good weekend and I'm back today on Monday morning joined by our tech guy and crypto guy, Ryan Dintz. Ryan, how are you doing? You're good, really. How are you? But we're not talking about tech today. We're talking no, about no. resources. Uh, <laughs> now, you 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 did your, your piece today. You started off with a story from from back in the day in Melbourne, actually, with, for, with a guy called Hugh Glass. Uh, do you just want to give a, a little update uh, on, on why you led with that story and how it relates to uh, investors today in the modern mining industry? Yeah, so I was at the, the library on Saturday with the kids, and usually when they're hopefully being peaceful in the kids section, I usually end up in the local history section, which I find always find fascinating. Um, you find all these cool little stories. And I was just reading about, um, I just picked up a random book in that, that that section, and I found out about this guy called Hugh Glass, who I'd never heard of, but he was the richest man in Victoria in 1862, which people might know was around about the time of the big gold rush in, um, in, in Melbourne. But he didn't actually make his money from gold. He made his uh, money from speculating on land. And he was a squatter, they called. So he was just you know, taking big tracts of land and government land and, and then selling it on and, and sort of speculating that other people would want it. And he built up this huge empire. He, he was a poor immigrant. He was an Irish immigrant from the 1840s. So he came from nothing. He built up this huge empire. And then, you know, <laughs> then, you know a few years later, he was bankrupt. And the reason I like that story was, um, you know, as a sort of speculative investor myself, it just reminded me that speculation has been going on for a long time. Um, and the thing that draws people in is just that chance of making a fortune from an uncertain situation, which is what Hugh Glass managed to do. Um, but then the risks of that is when you speculate at the wrong time or on the wrong assets, then... Um, then you can go bust as well. So just it was just a reminder to me because you think, you know, oh, speculation, that's a, a tech thing or it's a crypto thing. But speculation has always been with us, whether it's gold, land, uh, mining, crypto tech. It's, it's just, it, it, and I think speculation gets a bad name. Uh, people try sometimes divide themselves. Oh, I'm, a, I'm, I'm not a speculator, I'm an investor. But in my mind, there's no difference. All investing is a speculation of some kind or another. You're always betting on an uncertain future. And if you don't realize that, then you're, you're probably just uh, fooling yourself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was going to say, um, <clears throat> uh, th there's another story which it kind of reminds me of. There was a guy called William Knox Darcy, who who he he was a, a local lawyer in Rockhampton around the same time, I think. Like, and he, and, right. he, and he speculated on a gold mine, which ended up, long story short, funding the early exploration in in um, Persia and the company that he founded later became BP, which oh, is wow. a big oil company that we know. So that's yeah. a, uh, an example of a speculation that went right. But yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, th I think you're right. It's a mindset thing, and crucially, it's pr it's probably knowing what you're speculating on as well, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and look, I, I went from that story. Um, you think about the Australian economy. What's the thing you can speculate the most on in Australia as an Australian investor? Well, it's mining, isn't it? You just yep. talked about a mining investor that trade. You know, ended up creating BP. There's a lot of stories. We all know Triggy Forest's story of speculating on nickel. He he failed originally with, with the Anaconda thing in WA. Uh, then he came back again and he created Fortescue. So he he speculated, he failed, he came back, he did it again. And we all know, and like I've been in the markets, you know, 20, 25 years in Australia, mining is your, your chance of making a lot of money. But it's also a highly risky place. And the reason I want to talk about that today was because we're getting a lot of headlines right now um, saying that iron ore is declining, coal is declining, the prices, uh, copper prices are declining. I was reading headlines last week. All the mainstream headlines were saying, um, look, oh, we're in trouble here. This could be a prolonged downturn in China and we'll look out below for Australian mining and some weakness in the stock. And so I thought to, thought to myself, well, look, it, that's, um, that's what everyone's thinking, but is there another take on that? Um, mm. And that's what we're all about today well yeah you you mentioned there that you called it the, the whiff of panic spreading across the resources sector in your experience yeah. what like um what are the key indicators that suggest you we might be approaching a contrarian buying opportunity in mining stocks now i know you don't have your head in the mining sector but maybe there's some wisdom to part there before we go I mean, on to the, the, the general rule of thumb i know this sounds a bit glib but um when <laughs> people are driven people who are 
maybe say unsophisticated that don't understand what they're investing in, and this goes with any speculative sector, they, they, they invest on narratives, all right? So when, when China is booming, everyone piles into any, any company in the resources space because the narrative is everything's going to go up forever. When the narrative changes, um, that's when you start getting the first signs of a, of, of a contrarian indicator. Not straight away, perhaps, but that's when people believe the opposite. So what people believe right now, and this is why I'm interested in the resources space, is they believe that China is in big trouble. They believe that the property boom is, 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 is you know, the property sector in China is going to be in, you know, a decade-long decline. They believe, or, or they're starting to think it could be a global recession as well, and, and, and manufacturing in China is going to suffer. So that narrative gets start to get priced into the stock market, and this is what people don't understand. That even might all occur, but it might still represent a buying opportunity because it depends what's starting to get priced into the market. At the same time, you're seeing the, 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 the charts, like the charts of iron ore, the charts of copper, look a bit dangerous. So then you get the trading money, the hot money, the money that flows from sector to sector, getting out or even betting against the price, shorting it. And that creates that more panic. And then you get, like I said, you get the, the, the mainstream changing the narrative and saying, like one of the quotes I think had today said, we're about to enter a prolonged period of downturn. Like, so now the narrative, the mindset shift, China once was going to support everything. We're going to have, you know, copper demand from EVs and all this other narratives that are going to play out forever. And they're now switched to, oh no, everything's going to go down forever. And neither was true. You know what I mean? <laughs> neither of those narratives is ever true. But as the narrative shifts to a bearish mindset, prices come down, stocks come down. And if you know what you're doing, um, that's when you can find value. And I know our colleague, Greg Canavan, that's his whole investment strategy in a nutshell, isn't it? He looks for signs that everyone hates something. And then he says, well, is this price, is that all yeah. priced in? And is there value there? And I think that is, to me, um, you think about a mindset, right? You think about a junior miner um, that has a, a body of war. Uh, a valuable commodity there. Now they're only going to they're only going to mine it when the economic, economic conditions say to do that, right? But whether they do it now or later, the, it could, if if the if the ore body is there and it's it's a good ore body, then it's still an asset that's lying there. So that's what I'm thinking. Well, if these things get mispriced, if the if the value of what's lying under the ground is potentially worth X in the future, but right now the market's saying it's worth nearly nothing. And that's an opportunity uh, for you, and that's sort of uh, uh, that's sort of what I was writing about today. And and that's a hard thing to do. But we we have a guy in, in our company called James Cooper, who's a geologist, and that's what I've been reading a lot of his stuff re recently. And that's what he does day in day out. He looks at these uh, mining reports, he looks at the geology, and he can identify these assets. I and mean, he he doesn't always get the timing right or anything like that. But when I read his recommendations, you you know that you're getting something that has value. It's not just a punt because with mining, there's yeah. a lot of resources companies out there. Which, unless you're an expert, you don't know if this is an economic ec uh, deposit or if, if the mining stacks up or what other little problems it could be. Um, and so, what I, what I sort of use uh, James's work for myself is as a filter, almost. You know what I mean? As a way to say, well, these are stocks worth looking at. Whether you invest in them now or trade them later, they're still worth having. Well, what, what's that cliche? Um, many explorer companies are. Just a salesman standing with a big shiny smile, standing next to a well, hole in the ground. <laughs> they are look, and that goes for a lot of speculative areas. You know, you know, in a, in a, in a boom time for in, in crypto, for example, they say um, when crypto is booming, follow the advice of your stupidest mate. And it sounds, <laughs> it sounds weird, but they're just going to go into any project just because it's going up. And you can say, well, that's a rubbish project, but it, it, in a boom market, it tends to go up heaps. So. That happens in mining as well. I've traded mining stocks, you know, over the last 20 years. I'm well, you used to market. develop systems, right? For Yeah. And yeah. when you get it right, when you get the right sector, say lithium in 2017, I remember, or, or iron ore in the early 2000s, you get it right. You can genuinely make, you know, the types of returns that Hugh Glass made back in the 1850s. You know, you can make like 10, 50, even, even more, 100 times your money with the right one. Not saying that's easy, but that's what you can make in the boom times. We're not in a boom time right now, but what the opportunity there is slightly different is looking to get assets on the cheap that have that potential in the future. Because mining, for example, it's not going to go away as a resource that's going to be needed. It's just the timing that the market is worried about at the moment. It's as much going to be needed now or, or how much is going to be needed in the next six months, year. Uh, but the actual economic resources themselves aren't going away. So I think yeah. that's the, 
the the investment opportunity as I see it. So just a couple more questions. So so uh, I know you, you touched on the advantage of being among a team of analysts that are focusing on different sectors. There's always someone to call, right? And now, and you mentioned James, our in-house geo and resource stock expert. But now he suggests, I know that you've you've been you've had a couple of chats with him as well. He suggests that China's steel demand is shifting from construction to industrial manufacturing. Do, do you have any thoughts on how you think this transition might impact different types of mining companies? Or in particular subsectors, uh, do you think? Yeah, look, um, yeah. So what Jim sort of said, he said, I think uh, a few years ago, uh, construction made up fifty percent of the iron ore demand, uh, and now it's like twenty five percent. So that's that's quite a, a sizable shift. And um, I think as they move to manufacturing, as manufacturing makes a bigger uh, deal for their overall mining demand, I think the opportunity is to look at individual um, resources on their own merits. So. For example, we we've been in, in the tech investing service. We've been looking at certain metal alloys which are used in different fields of tech, and some of the angle there is that China has a bit of a stronghold in some of these uh, niche uh, niche materials and minerals, and um, and so the likes of the U.S. and other Western strategic partners are looking for alternative sources of supply because China has spent the last decade locking up a lot of these niche materials up, which are used in like EVs or uh, weaponry systems uh, or different areas of tech. So I think the way forward it, it is not the the old story of China's got a population they're going to build a, you know a million cities for them and it's going to need iron ore and coal and you know construction. That is still going to be a story. Um, but as manufacturing takes more of a hold, it's going to be well, what are the metals um, that are going to fulfill that demand, which are of strategic importance, uh, and then what are the supply demand dy- dynamics underlying it? So, is how much exploration has been going on for this? How hard is it to extract? So, take uranium for example. If, if the world moved to nuclear energy, yeah. uranium, the timeline to get right, uranium mine up is you know a decade. So it's not like if, if uranium prices go higher, it's not like new supply can come on overnight. And there's certain other materials like that, so rare earth one, where the production is pretty complicated. The production process is complicated to get the, the final material. So you, there's a lot of lot to it, but I think that's the exciting thing, especially with speculation. The more there is to it, the more uncertainty it is. Yeah. The more yeah. is your upside reward when you get it right, which I think is the... the yeah, and, and I guess uh, just the, a final point is is not many people sort of um, link Australia to the tech sector, right? And that it's all about mining. And it is, but people, a lot of people don't actually realise how intertwined resources are with advances in tech too. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, right. Like, yeah, we've, I think I've written about that before, and we've talked about that in the tech investing sector. Um, while a lot of our investments are, you know, software companies or chip companies, um, we have added a couple of, you know, material, well, mineral uh, companies in recent times because tech, <laughs> you think it's uh, zeros and ones and binary digits. But behind all that are data centers, which require, you know, heaps of material to build, different cooling technologies, all the wiring that goes into it, all the servers, all the all the all this, the material going on the chips. There's a the materials are the fundamental building block of every industry, including tech. Um, and as you get things like the AI rollout, there's there's certain interesting um, uh, new materials that are going to be more in demand. Just like what happened with the the rise of electric cars. You know, yeah. the lithium wasn't on anyone's radar. I remember. Uh, reading about a book called Pig- Pigmatites of the Pilbara or something it was called. It was it was a mining good of all these rocks lying around in, in Western Australia and it had all this information on lithium and no one cared about that. They were just interested in iron ore. But then when the lithium boom started to take off in 2014, this pigment pigmatites of the of the Pilbara became this really right. valuable resource for, for geologists like James because they could uh, find where the lithium was that previously people didn't care about. So it's funny how a certain material might not be worth something in one epoch of time but then when a a tech field takes it on and and it becomes a a viable economic part of that supply chain then suddenly it becomes really viable so Mm. the interesting thing about tech there is you find this technology you work out well what are the materials they're going to use and what are the likely contenders Um, because there's there's usually more than one for example um then yeah you can you can link the the tech and mining story and as an aussie investor that's um that's good if you can do that. <laughs> yeah, and f- and final point is like so obviously uh, with your wheelhouse being tech and crypto, and you're used to the big big swings and, and yeah. peaks and the and the big falls. Um, with that in mind, like and given the current market sentiment in the mining sector, um, and the potential for further price drops in iron ore and things like that, uh, is there any advice you can give to investors in, in, to how they can balance balance that with uh, the risks and the opportunities? Yeah. So 
the, the thing about investing is uh, you need to know the market you're investing in at that point in time. So in a market that looks to be weak in the short term, what is your advantage? Your advantage is to look for value. You look for you look to be on the other side of the panic sellers. You look to be a strategic buyer. And so that means you need to be patient. You don't need to rush into it. You need to know what you're buying. In the case of mining, you need to have an idea of what is the economic value lying in the ground. So that's why I find James's insights useful. Um, and you can go on with the strategy with any speculative investing is it's only ever going to make up a certain portion of your portfolio. You're not going to bet the farm on one junior miner <laughs> with, a, with a potential yeah. deposit. You know, you think about all your different types of investment, what type of investor you are, what is your time frame as well. So you, you might lay down a bit now, it might not do anything for two years, but if you bought well and you've, you've made it a part of your portfolio where you're, you can still sleep at night no matter what it does, you might get the payoff three years from now. Other speculative sectors, when when things are booming, then you need to be fast. You need to get in. You need to get in a little bit quicker. You need to look for yeah. momentum. You look for the hot money flows. And um, before mining right now, but my my so and maybe for some aspects of tech, even AI has slowed down over the past you know six months. So you can be a bit more patient, which is fine. You can take a bit more time to do your research. And basically, what you're trying to do, which is the old investment trick of all time, is buy something cheaper than what is going to be worth at some point in the future you know mm -hmm. it's as simple as that in theory but... <laughs> simple and and added to that just pick yeah. stocks that go up that's all you got to do yeah. anyway yeah exactly yeah if only. <laughs> anyway thanks ryan that's really helpful today and very insightful and look that's what we're trying to do is just help our readers make more sense of the world and, and find value where 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 it's currently showing right now so that hopefully we can do exactly that in the years ahead Thanks for watching. Ryan, thanks for your time today. And like I say, every time, give us a subscribe to the YouTube if you like these daily videos. Uh, if you'd like to read Ryan's piece today, which is all about the resource sector and uh, the opportunities there, do head over to our website. I'll provide the direct link to the article below. And also there's a sign up page. And we've also just released a presentation with James Cooper on the mining sector as well. So lots of stuff to, to dig into. Hope you enjoy it. Ryan, have a great day, mate. See you.